2014 was eerily similar to the previous three seasons for the Cincinnati Bengals. A team that was good but never great had some signature victories for this team, most notably their victory late in the regular season against Denver, where to me they kind of dominated the Broncos. Uh, but then they get to the playoffs and they get bounced in the first round again, this time by the Indianapolis Colts. So that's four straight trips to the playoffs, four straight seasons with a winning record, four straight first round one and done playoff exits. So you have a Cincinnati Bengals organization that's kind of in a bit of a quandary here because on the one, time, one hand, they're a good team. But on the other hand, you get to the point, you question whether or not they can actually become a really good or great team. On the other hand, they're good enough where you can't really sit there and say, hey, we need to get crazy here, we need to blow it up, we need to implode this, da 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 But the way the Cincinnati Bengals have been the past four years, I would compare to being an NBA team that's just good enough to get maybe a six or seven seed in the playoffs in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, you're a playoff team. You make it to the playoffs every single year, but you're not very good. You have no real championship aspirations, and you get bounced in the first round. You're spending a lot of money just to sit there and play a few extra games for the hell all of it. And in the Bengals' case, you're spending a lot of money uh, throughout the course of a season just to play one extra game. You know, at some point in time, is that payoff really there anymore? Now, with that said, I didn't expect the Cincinnati Bengals this offseason to get too crazy in what they did, even though they to me, still had a bit of cap space where they could do whatever they needed to do. Uh, to me, this is a team that part of their strength over the past four years has been their chemistry, has been their continuity in terms of the roster and what they do. So you don't want to necessarily want to rock the boat too much because you have to hope at some point in time you can put it together. And while you might let somebody like a Jermaine Gresham go in a free agency, you might bring back a Michael Johnson, who had departed the year before in free agency. I didn't expect the Cincinnati Bengals to be very active in the offseason, and nor should they have been, because that's not really what they've been built on over the past few years. That's not really their identity. Um, you know, To me, it's more so for them is you get those young players into the fold, and then you grow them, you develop them, and then you resign them, and you keep them there for long term. That's a more successful formula, you know, in the NFL. And the Cincinnati Bengals, to a degree, have been following that formula. Now, when you look at their draft philosophy as well, you can kind of see where sometimes they'll have a philosophy in terms of an area or uh, a segment of the offense or a defense that they want to approach. But they still kind of play their board. They still kind of go best player available in a lot of ways. And you see that in this draft where they were gambling on somebody like a Cedric Obehi at number 21, the offensive tackle from Texas A&M, saying, hey, he might not play at all this year with Whitworth man in the left side, but long term he might be our left tackle or left guard of the future. And you bring in a Jake Fisher in the second round out of Oregon, another offensive tackle, you may say, hey, maybe at some point in time he'll end up playing on the right side, or maybe he plays long term on the left side and Obehi plays on the right side. You're looking at this from a philosophy of, you want to invest in that offensive line, similar to how the Dallas Cowboys did, and that was successful for them ultimately in 2014. Maybe the Bengals want to get younger, more athletic on the outside of their offensive line long term to protect Andy Dalton and uh, open up bigger, better running holes for their tandem of running backs that they have with Jeremy Hill and Giovanni Bernard. It makes sense. And then you look at you know, some of the other picks that they made, guys like uh, Marcus Hardison and uh, guys like a uh, Josh Shaw. These are guys that were good values where they were, but they weren't necessarily huge needs. But at the same point in time, these are guys that could end up being contributors down the road. Kind of in a way, a uh, typical Cincinnati Bengals draft out of the recent years. Now looking at this Bengals roster heading into 2015, I look at their strengths. I say their offensive line is a bit of a strength. I don't think they have one of the very best units in the NFL, but I think they're a solid unit uh, in the infusion of youth with a Jake Fisher and long-term, maybe Cedric Obehi, if he ends up playing at all in 2015, or if he doesn't. You know, I still think that offensive line is a solid asset for them. I think they're solid in the passing game, and they're even better in the running game. And speaking of the running game, I think this is the real strength of the Cincinnati Bengals team, especially for their offense, is their running game. 
When you look at that tandem with Jeremy Hill and Giovanni Bernard, you have a great young one-two combination, that thunder and lightning combination, if you will, in every sense in the backfield. That could do so many things for your offense and, frankly, your defense as well. To have that type of young running back tandem and be able to have them in the fold at least through next season and perhaps even longer long term, you know, really bodes well for the Cincinnati Bengals and their ability to be able to play a physical kind of control the clock type of offensive style, which could also help out their defense. I also look at the Cincinnati Bengals too, and as I referenced a little bit earlier when talking about them, I think one of their biggest strengths is their chemistry and their continuity. Marvin Lewis has been on the job since 2003. This is season number 13, yeah, believe it or not. He's been there 13 years. So there's a consistency of message. There's a consistency in the leadership. There's not a lot of wondering about Marvin Lewis and his job, even though maybe there should be and maybe there will throughout the season. There's an understanding that this is the top, this is what's going to be expected out of the top, and this is what you need to do where you can fall in line in order to get in where you fit in. And that continuity is important when I talk about a team like the Green Bay Packers and so much of their roster is drafted by the front office and they stay there for years be, become familiar with the system they grow with each other they learn everybody's strengths and weaknesses they learn where they fit in where they could contribute where somebody else could pick up their slack you know that's something that the cincinnati bengals have working for them as well and that's something that you know while having the most talent is great you know, sometimes you prefer to have that chemistry and continuity because that can really come into play, especially in some big situations. Now, I do have some concerns about this Bengals team heading into 2015. First and foremost, I mean, you got to be honest here. Andy Dalton is a concern. He's a legitimate concern. They're paying him pretty big money to not be a franchise quarterback. Andy Dalton is an average NFL starter. He plays like an average NFL starter, similar to a Jay Cutler. He'll have those games where he plays pretty well. And then he has those games that you wonder why the hell anybody would ever pay him starting NFL quarterback money. That's Andy Dalton. And the Bengals, in some ways, are a reflection of Andy Dalton. They're a good team, but they're not a great team. They're not a terrible team. But they have those games where they look like world beaters, where they look like they could be Super Bowl champions. And then they have those games where they can't beat the scrub teams. They have those games where they absolutely look like they don't show up and they don't want to play. And again, I think in a lot of ways that is a reflection of Andy Dalton. And ultimately, most teams are a reflection of their starting quarterback, and in particular, their style of play and their leadership. And that's a huge concern for me for the Cincinnati Bengals heading into this season because do you really want to have it be five straight years where you make the playoffs just to get bounced in the first round? Andy Dalton's got to be better if this team has any chance of progressing going forward. I also have some concerns about their pass rush. Yes, they brought in back Michael Johnson, but... Think about it. Tampa signed him to do a huge deal and cut him after one season. What does that tell you? But this was a Bengals defense that had been solid the past couple of years, but in 2014 just couldn't get to the quarterback of the opposing teams. I think they had like 20 sacks. They were like second to last or last in the league. It was terrible either way. And I'm not sure they got a whole lot better with their pass rush. The Bengals need to get better with their pass rush. They truly do. If they want to be a defense that can play at a top 10, top 12 type of level and be a team that can help carry this team deeper into the playoffs. I also have concerns on offense about the weapons they have around A.J. Green. No more Jermaine Gresham in the fold. Uh, you've got Mohamed Sanu. He's okay. You've got Marvin Jones coming back from an injury after he basically missed all of 2014. But there's not a lot of consistency and there's not a lot of uh, proven commodities opposite A.J. Green in that passing game. I mean, you're going to a Tyler Eifert who missed pretty much all of 2014 with an injury when he was supposed to make some growth in year number two. So some serious concerns about when you talk about Andy Dalton. It's great that he's got A.J. Green, but in the passing game, what else does he really have? What, maybe Giovanni Bernard? Again, when you talk about the running back perhaps being your second-best weapon in the passing game, that's not always necessarily a good thing. Now, in terms of players to watch for this Bengals team in 2015, I'll go to Tyler Eifert, their third-year tight end, their first-round pick in 2013 out of Notre Dame. There's no more Jermaine Gresham. The starting job is his. He missed pretty much all of last season due to injury. They need Eifert to play like a first-round pick. They need him to be that number two option in the passing game to provide a safety blanket, a safety valve for Andy Dalton. Uh, Marvin Jones, I think, is another one, too, because there were flashes back in 2013 where he showed he could be that number two weapon opposite A.J. Green. And bringing him back into the fold, if he could stay healthy for an entire season, you've got A.J. Green, you've got Marvin Jones and Mohamed Sanu, 
that passing game becomes a little more versatile for the Cincinnati Bengals, a little more explosive, and perhaps most importantly of all, just a little bit more consistent and effective. So Marvin Jones' health is going to be a big deal for this Bengals team in 2015. On the defensive side of the ball, I look at Michael Johnson. This is one of these situations where the Bengals let him go in free agency last offseason. He went to Tampa, chased the money. It didn't work out well for Cincinnati. It didn't work out well for him either. Now he's back in Cincinnati. Maybe it's a deal where both sides realized uh, what they bring to the table for each other, and maybe Michael Johnson could step back in and provide some additional edge rush for a Bengals defense that very badly needs it. If this Bengals defense is going to improve in 2015 and they're going to get better with their pass rush, Michael Johnson's going to have to be a big part of that. And then I look at last year's first-round pick, Darkeese Dennard. I really didn't see much out of him as a rookie, which doesn't surprise me all that much. And in a defensive backfield like the Bengals have, you know they need Dennard to play like the first-round pick he was last year. They, they can't sit there and go through another season where he's barely playing or he's playing in the, the dime packages, and that's it. They need Dennard to be a starter, become a starter at some point in time this year. They need him to play legitimately like he's an NFL starter. Now, in terms of the Bengals' schedule, there's one stretch of games. It's a seven-week stretch early on in the year that I think will tell you a lot about the Cincinnati Bengals team. Because uh, I don't think the second half of the season, the schedule is all that terribly bad. But it's that stretch of schedule between weeks two and nine. When you throw a bye week in there, there's seven games in eight weeks. And I think that's right there. The first eight games of the season, by and large, is going to tell you all you need to know about this Cincinnati Bengals team in 2015. We've got San Diego at home. Then they go to Baltimore. They've got KC and Seattle at home. Then they go to Buffalo, a bye week to Pittsburgh, and they host Cleveland. Now, I throw Cleveland in there because during that eight-week stretch where they play seven games, that's a divisional game against each of the other three divisional teams in the AFC North. You know, if you want to ensure yourself a playoff spot, the best way to do that is to win your division. you got to be able to handle your business in the division in order to do that. So when you look at it, for a Bengals team that has to go to Baltimore, to Pittsburgh, and then host Cleveland, they need to find a way to win two of those three divisional games. They must, if they have any designs on trying to win that division and trying to for sure lock up another playoff spot in 2015, they need to find a way to win two of those games. And then other potential playoff teams in the AFC like San Diego, Kansas City, and Buffalo, these are teams that Cincinnati needs to beat because it could potentially matter when it comes down to tiebreakers at the end of the season to get into the playoffs. If you beat them head-to-head, -head, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to get into the playoffs than if you don't, and it's that simple. So you look at that stretch of schedule. The Bengals have got to find a way to come out of that eight, that seven-game stretch excuse me, with a winning record. That mean they have to be six and one or seven and zero. Oh. That might not be very likely, but a five and two or even a four and three, yeah, they do. If they want to go to the playoffs again this year, they need to go at least four and three during that stretch. So that way, if they win week one and then they go four and three during that stretch, they're five and three and they've got eight games to go. They still got to feel pretty good about their chances to at least win ten games. My overall thoughts on the Bengals is that ultimately they're a good team, but they're not a great team, and I don't know if they're ever going to be a great team which isn't always necessarily the best place to be. This team, in a lot of ways, feels very similar to the Bengals' teams of the past four years. It's a team that, on the one hand, I want to get bigger on, and I want to believe in more. But we've done this song and dance before. We've been down this road before, and I know I most certainly have. And fool me once, shame on you. Fooled me twice, three times, shame on mother and me. I just don't see where this team got so much better in the offseason where they're going to be any different where they have been the past four years. There are other teams that would love to be in that position, but at some point in time, just getting to the playoffs is not good enough. And really, frankly, this season is not just about Andy Dalton, but a lot of ways it is. That's ultimately going to be the measuring stick because at the end of the day, if Dalton doesn't become better, the Bengals are never going to get past a certain point. And if they don't get past a certain point with Andy Dalton, then at some point in time they have to move on from Andy Dalton. If they have to move on from Andy Dalton, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I don't know if the Bengals need to be in that position as of this time where they need to start worrying about rebuilding. So like I said, 
You know, there are other factors involved, but at the end of the day, it really, in a lot of ways, is about Andy Dalton fair or not. That's the truth of the matter. Uh, this is a Bengals team that I think can potentially win 11 games. I think 12 is potentially pretty rich. Um, but if they match their quarterback in terms of his inconsistency and his up-and-down nature at times, this is also a Bengals team that has the capability to go 8-8. Eight and eight. I'd be more likely to think that they'll win nine, perhaps ten games in 2015. Because, like I said, they've got a lot of continuity in their system. They've got pretty good chemistry on both sides of the ball. And they do have some talent on both sides of the ball, especially on the offensive end with A.J. Green and the one-two combination they have at running back in Jeremy Hill and Giovanni Bernard. There's a lot of teams that would like to have those guys at wide receiver and running back. But they've got Andy Dalton. They've got a defense that... Took a step back in 2014 that I have concerns about whether or not they're going to rush the passer. This may be a playoff team for the Cincinnati Bengals, but unless something dramatically changes, that's about all they're going to be again.